When it comes to art, and I think of this specifically in music, people think it's a luxury. They think that it's like this nice thing that we can collect and that we can, you know, spend time with and all this stuff. And he said it's, and it's a luxury in most people's minds until you lose a loved one, you go through a breakup, you go through high highs, you have the time of your life, you go through the deepest depths of your life, then it becomes necessity because it unlocks a, something that we can relate to that, that, that helps us to connect with that feeling even stronger. Hello and welcome to the Ronnie Lever Show where every week we bring you fascinating guests with inspiring stories of success and overcoming obstacles from the world of sports, business and entertainment. To support this channel, please subscribe, turn on the notification bell and hit the like button so that we can deliver you the best content possible. He's a curious and creative entrepreneur. He has a background in data science. He's a, thai, uh, he's a tech star founder specialized in music tech, psychology, and behavioral change. He started composing at the age of eight and is currently working for the score of an upcoming Amazon Prime movie. He loves to connect with people on their passions and inspiring them to find their creative, playful side. Joining us live from Denver, Colorado to talk with us about the wonders of music, how it impacts our emotions and connection with each other. Ladies and gentlemen, I'm happy to have him on the show. Please welcome, here is Aaron Winfield. Hello. <laughs> Hello. Thanks for having Ooh. me, Ronnie. Thank you for being on the show. Welcome. When you, when you think of your journey so far, and I mean you're still quite young, what comes to mind to you also you when go. you're listening to your own accolades? When you, when you phrase that question, um, are, are you, are you asking based on what I've been through so far, what is kind of like the forward thinking motion that I have to, to step into? What I'm, what I'm asking is basically, um, wherever we are at in the world, yeah. Uh, anybody. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and whatever we have, uh, the journey that we've gone through is, do you see yourself as already accomplished? Do you yourself as on the way? Do you yourself as like, wow, this is a lot. The, like uh, whatever comes to mind to you. I love this question. Um, cause it, it, it kind of, it kind of has me going in two different ways. One is, is I've always found my, myself very connected with, with my path and my vision and where I want to go. Um, I told my colleague the other day that if I were to die today, I would die a happy man because I've done everything I need to do. I've, I've lived all of the experiences I need to go or to, to, to actually do in life. But as I think about how can I continue to, to add the cherry on top with that? Um, I, I definitely think it, it's, there's a huge calling in terms of being more creative, in terms of bringing inspiration to others, in terms of getting inspiration for myself so I can continue to create. And that's always been through the mediums of music or technology, building things for people, um, especially in mental health or in healthcare kinds of environments. Um, but, but when you frame the question the way that you did, I, I can't help but think that there's a huge time right now with artificial intelligence and especially within uh, mental health and the way that, that people are receiving social media at all seconds during the day and how disconnected we can become in a different way while being connected through a machine. Um, that causes a lot of, of intense uh, emotions, including like high dopamine kinds of things. And, and I feel like, I feel like we're at a place where we can use artificial intelligence for good. We can use content for good, um, as a power of influence and motivation to become for people to become the best version of themselves. And I think music has its place in that category as well. So I, I feel like to answer your question, um, long windedly, I feel like my path is to continue down the path of applying music and creative energy toward a mental health context and leveraging whatever tools and tech we can uh, to, to push that forward. 
Wow, very, very inspiring. And, and, and you were also mentioning if you would die today, you would die a happy man. And that yeah. you also lived according to your vision. So that actually brings me to, to the next path. Um, first of all, what was it that you had imagined that you would become as a, as a kid? And also, uh, what's your vision? <laughs> it's drastically different. When I was 12, I wanted to be a surgeon. And I think it's because maybe I was trying to impress my dad and, and really just wanted to, to, to do something that was good, but also that maybe made a little bit of money. And make no mistake a about it. A little bit. I, yeah. <laughs> um, make no mistake about it. I've been playing piano since I've been five. I've Math and music, I often describe as my first two languages. And the English is a distant third. And then German is like a distant, distant fourth. Um, but I've always had a huge calling for patterns and, and sound and trying to find things um, in systems around us. And so for me, I feel like my secret mission when I was a child was to, was to find the next uh, problem solving escapade in physics or in chemistry or whatever it is, or it was to become a rock star and write songs much like Bono did, um, winning, you know, getting knighted, writing poems that, that, that have, changed many people's lives. So that's really where I think my intention was. I can say I've done a little bit of it, um, but but not the full manifestation of it. Wow. I love one thing that you said also was your first language is a math and music. Yeah. And when you mentioned that, for many people, when they think about music, it's, it's a very creative mysterium and it, it just... It vibes, it, it creates some emotions inside, it, it moves you, depending on the music. You might like it, you might not like it. There's hardly any music that doesn't give you any emotion at all. And most people do not think about music in terms of math. So how much math is in music? For me, it's entirely filled with, with math. Um, when I was five, I learned piano and I feel like, um, piano is a good instrument for kids to learn. Now I'm biased, right? Because that's, that's where I started. But, but at the same time, you're learning chord structures with your right hand. You're learning arpeggios with your right hand, but you're also learning the fundamentals of bass. And within that piano is an extremely rhythmic instrument. So you have to keep time and and keep on four, four, keep on three, four kinds of um, uh, patterns. And I say that very specifically because rhythm is like the first thing that comes to mind when it comes to patterns. Um, if, I'm, if I'm trying to see how many stories are in a building, I know that this is like a really dumb example to bring up, but if I want to just playfully count, like, like how many stories does a building have, right? If I'm looking at like a 25 story building, what I'll do is I'll clump it into sections that are like four, four time signatures and say, oh, that's got eight bars. It's a 32 story building, right? And the same thing kind of exists within um, other, I, I feel like timing, your timing and pacing of things becomes a lot better. Um, how can I time this stoplight? How can I time when to like walk? How can I, there's really quirky, um, uh, fun, playful things that come from, I think, pattern recognition. And I feel like a rhythm is a good like baseline for building that. And then if you get into chords and, and melodic structure and those kinds of things, it makes it a little bit more advanced of a, of a pattern structure that, that helps you to get curious and, and understand, oh, there's different dimensions in which I can think about patterns. And I think that curiosity starts to extend outside of music into um, uh, other kinds of things like, like doing your taxes, um, uh, clustering things during a data science problem, uh, whatever, whatever that might mean, artificial intelligence algorithms, right? Um, so you, you got me hooked here uh, when yeah. you, when you do your taxes, love it. you think about music, how does that relate? Like how, how can you make somebody feel better about doing their taxes? Yeah. So it relates it's not a direct connection. Um, 
but but it relates in this way so so when you when you listen to a song right away i'll start to recognize the patterns what's the genre what's like how would i play if i were to if somebody were to toss a piano in my lap and then bring me on stage with with a musician i've never heard before after hearing two bars i could start to jam with that guy because or or gal or in between right um but but i would be able to pick up in the first nowadays two bars. you never know exactly and the first two bars i would pick it up and and i'd start to say okay they're playing a c to a g to an f to an a which is the most convention conventional four chord structure but i can actually improvise and play with that and just or add drums or whatever it might be and when you're doing your taxes <laughs> It's not dissimilar in the sense where you might have certain expenses that you're looking for and, and it's fun. Like you run your own business, right? I, I run three or four of my own businesses and my accountants are always impressed because I'll take maybe 10,000 rows of data and I'll categorize it into, is this a software, a hardware or whatever expense? And I don't use Oracle or, or, um, uh, whatever tax software products are out there, I just use Excel. And then I find patterns in which I can isolate certain things and tag them quickly within this, this 20 minute game that I'm giving myself to actually do it. So it's kind of like a Sudoku puzzle. Tony Robbins, one of my mentors, and I know that you also uh, are familiar with Tony, has said that basically there are three things around patterns that, that are very useful. First is pattern recognition you already talked about that like recognizing patterns the next one is pattern utilization like you're utilizing the patterns that you actually have recognized and the third thing is pattern creation like it's like a three-step process and when you're thinking of wow. like listening to you i've heard a lot the word patterns so can you go in depth a little bit to tell the listener or to tell our audience in what way they could utilize patterns to make their lives easier. So the most practical emerging example of, of creating, of, of synthesizing patterns that can help you out would be artificial intelligence or, or getting involved in chat GPT and figuring out what kinds of patterns come from a prompt that you give to it, right? Um, getting involved with low code tools, for instance, that are Notion or um, other kinds of technologies where you can say, if this happens, then this happens, or if this happens and then this happens, then this will happen. And if this happens, but this doesn't happen, then make this happen instead, right? Um, that That is kind of a, that's a good way in which I can say, I guess the summary of that is technology is bringing us to a place where we can understand our own patterns. Um, what kind of, what kind of output are we looking to do? Are we trying to write a report? Are we trying to tell a story? Are we trying to, um, make our work lives easier? Right. And if you can understand, from start to finish, to use Tony Robbins, I forget the words you said, if I can recognize what, what is happening from start to finish through the entire chain, how can I actually start to build the building blocks of if this, then that statements that start to Like build. how to utilize it as next is the next thing, like pattern exactly. utilization is number two? Exactly, U utilization is probably your acknowledgement that, oh my gosh, I recognize a pattern and I am going to to actually use my my thoughts to create a pattern that's good for me. And you said the third one was synthesis, right? Pattern creation was the third one. Pattern creation. So, so I don't know exactly um, what Tony Robbins was going like for. Did like, did it create what, your own patterns, basically? Yeah, and and for me, I'm just if I was to take this analogy to the hoop, um, we all have ways in which we think about certain things we have thought models we have ways in which we do things we we wake up we eat breakfast we i uh, we to make the breakfast we put the cereal in then we put the milk in then we grab a spoon then we put it in our mouths and after we're done 
We probably go to the bathroom. <laughs> then we walk to the garage. We put on our shoes. We tie our shoes. Then we grab our keys. We go to the car and whatever. And that is all like, oh my gosh, I do that every day. I do that every day. If I could find a way to, to build a model around this so that I don't have to do that every day, then basically I can create this pattern that allows me to, um, to automate these things in my life that, that I think the power of that is, is when you automate things in your life, you can spend more time thinking critically and strategically about what your next move is and how to make more of an impact. And that's where I feel like patterns are really, really successful is because you can operate your own business. You can operate your own life. Now, obviously you wouldn't make your own, build a bot that makes your own breakfast. Maybe you would, that's kind of crazy. There are some finer things in life, like tying your shoes is is a breath of fresh air. Um, but I give that as an example of like what what this could look like. Okay, so basically, also from in, in other words, like you're building systems, you're building yes. systems to make like for for predetermined processes to make your life easier. And to think in that way, like what's the system around that? Like what are the the, the actions that I'm doing repetitively that I can make my life easier because that somebody else can do it or somebody else can help me with, or it might exactly. be, a, it might be AI that can help me with that. So exactly. And to, to take that to the hoop real quick, um, I see a song as a system. And then within that song, there are patterns that happen within that system. Like the chorus. Um, exactly. The build up, And so oh, I don't know what the technical words are, but no, that's, those are great words for it. Okay, we are going to get into that. So um, let's talk about music. First of all, you mentioned that, that you started playing piano when you were five. I also know that you started composing when you were eight. So take us uh, through your mu musical journey. Like, uh, how was that when you became a kid? Uh, when you were a kid, what were the instruments that you were learning? Like, I know that, wow, uh, for example, for my own example, I, I played four different instruments when I was a kid. And also, I would like to have your take on not just your journey, but also how it actually changed the way you think, like not just in terms of patterns, but I believe that there is some synapses that are being created inside yeah. the brain that only can be created through music and through having also this tact, this rhythm, this beat, <clears throat> this also then transferred into other areas of your life. So that those are many things dumped at you at once. So first of all, your musical journey and also how music translates in, into other areas. Wow. Okay. So, and you're not off the hook. I am going to ask you once I'm done with, with this, the four instruments that you played, because something tells me we have a jam session coming up. <laughs> so, so the journey, it's, it's kind of a funny story. Um, my parents forced me into piano when I was five and I, for some reason, I, I don't know how it came up, but, but I was always good at picking things up by ear. So my friends would ask me to play things on the radio and I would just pick it out within seconds. And, and that's just been a gift. I don't know if it's natural. I don't know if it was learned through piano lessons, but, but the reason why I say that is because when I was like six or seven, I was a bit bored. I didn't want to go to piano lessons. I would always be kicking and screaming. I wouldn't practice until the morning of. It was always on a Wednesday and I would dread it. I would quickly practice the songs and then, you know, go in and get a B plus, um, which is, I think, a grade two in Austria. And basically, um, I, when I wasn't practicing piano, I was playing piano and it was just randomly screwing around with skateboarding tricks. Like, like, how can I play what's on the radio? How can I kind of dabble with my own things? And, and there, it wasn't until I was eight where I kind of formed this, this whole idea. It was called the creator, uh, probably appropriately titled. And it, it was this full song, this full length song that had a melody that had chord structure that had a beat no lyrics. I wasn't a lyricist, but it was this, this song. And I brought it into my piano teacher and she, she was like, you did what? She was really excited, really impressed. And, um, I went through maybe like a year of writer's block and didn't write my next song until I was nine. 
<laughs> but but in, um, I I would say that like in my early childhood, I uh, playing by ear and learning piano was a good foundation for me to learn bass, rhythm, melody, how all things kind of connect together. And by the time I was 14, I was just really cranking out song after song after song for my high school band and college bands that, um, that, that I had played for. Uh, I was always top of my class in math and, and it's, there was always kind of this, this, um, game to be played where, where I would have to solve the problem the quickest in my class. I would have to um, solve it with the smartest approach. And I feel like a lot of that was not only just a competitive nature, but also it came through the pattern um, sound waves that I was picking up when I was playing. So I feel like, like for me, when, when it comes to thinking, yes, I have this left brain data science pattern kind of thing. But when you're composing music, you're tapping into like this creative storytelling, which is highly vulnerable. It's, it's something that I am probably um, the most grateful for in my life is just the ability to, to go somewhere for 30 minutes. My mind is completely disconnected from everything other than the present moment of playing an instrument or, or telling a story. And, and that was a gift that came to me when I was 14. It just really started to, to happen more and more and more. And for me, that comes from a place of, of um, my, my brain has been shaped to be a very, um, like more of a feeler or a somatic kind of thinker, somebody who, who feels their way through a situation as opposed to thinks their way through a situation so, so much and overanalyzes everything. I feel like that has been the translation of composition, of, of just kind of feeling my way through a story, whether it be a breakup or a loss of loved one or whatever it might be. Long-winded. But... What's that? Probably too long-winded of a, of a response, but yeah. No, it sounds very much like, um, like basically <laughs> your, your right brain and your left brain where the right half and the left half are very much intertwined or connected in a way. Because on, on the one they hand, are. you have all the logical, mathematical um, side, which you also bring over to the creative part, and, and yep. you're connected with that. Yep. Yeah, it's sometimes I... Um, moving to New York City was probably the most left brain thing that I've ever done in my life. Because you're always plugged in to a business or to a community you're always talking you're always like everything's flying at you at once you have to you're constantly thinking about things and it's tough to find the space to to shut off from that to go into your home to just connect with with like an activity that that helps you to be creative and i feel like um after living in new york for 17 years it i uh, there's always this constant battle of Aaron woke up in the morning. I wake up in the morning. I'm running through all of my to do's. How can I be the best business partner? How can I create, you know, um, everlasting change for our customers, whatever it might be. And I have to journal or go on walk and talks to, to basically come out of that space and say, say, think creatively, think outside the box. You'll come back to these problems, but you'll be able to address them in a more um, interesting way that can actually go a lot further than just doing it so regimentedly, if that makes sense. It's almost like challenging yeah. your comfort zone. And 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 what what comes to mind to me when you mentioned before also that with fourteen, it, it took you until you were fourteen years old until you finally figured out how to approach that. And mm -hmm. on the one hand, you were talking about constantly thinking. On yeah. the other hand, it sounds to me like being in the zone, being in the flow, like being totally there, which is the realm of not thinking. Exactly. So how does thinking and not thinking for you fit together? And also for somebody who might want to have a shortcut to get into that zone, like in, in the preliminary zone or in that zone where actually the magic happens, how do you get there? Yeah, there are two forces that, that don't speak well 
to each other. Um, it's it's all it's as if you're you have this like bipolar two brain kind of scenario that's happening, and and one is competing with the other. Um, but at the same time, it helps you to if you can know how to switch roles between one and the other. Um, it it I feel like it's an appropriate skill to have. I feel like everybody should have these skills. So just to be clear, when I was in high school and throughout college, I was only right brain. And I don't, a lot of people debunk this left brain, right brain things, but you know what I mean? Like high school, college, I was fully creative, fully like tapped into my, my soul. And then the day I moved to New York, which is probably when I was 25 to date myself, that was 16 years ago, I started to kind of roll over. It took maybe five years into this fast talking, pardon my French, uh, bleep that one out, um, where, where I was always thinking and like operating on things that, that had to be done on time because New York is such a fast paced thing and your job calls for it. And um, I would say for me today, in my early 40s, I am now um, reminding myself in the mornings that you have to practice your creative muscles. You have to train those creative muscles so that you can so that you can know when to show up with an ounce of creative thought in the day. Um, I feel like practicing and stretching your creative muscles allows you to to not only think in different ways, but it allows you to, to come into this present space where you are filled with gratitude and you're, you're getting from the world. You're able to give back to it in a playful way with, 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 um, abundant ideation and output, but you still need to know how to execute. And that's where the left brain comes in is like, when you have this thought on paper, how can you now do the, the practical tasks that need to be done in order for it to get there. And I feel like they're both necessary skills that people need in order to achieve the things that they want. So how do you actually practice your creative muscles or how also not, not just you, but in general, how can somebody yep. practice their creative muscles? I tend to steal from um, the artist way, which is written by Julia Cameron. And she has two right off the bat things that you have to do unwavering rules every morning you write three pages of just random gobbledygook it just comes straight from three pages three pages now i do it a little bit differently and this is still on topic one i go for a walk and talk so <laughs> this is this is going to out myself a little bit but i'll bring my phone I'll go for a 30 minute walk, probably around your apartment and other places, and I'll record with my earbuds in. Um, now the trick is I act as if I'm talking to somebody on the phone, like, like, yeah, mom, that's exactly, I'll go to the store. But what I do is I tell myself stories and I'm talking out about three pages of just random things. And I've noticed that in journaling, and I'm pretty sure many people feel the same way when when you are journaling or walking and talking as i call it for me um it's you're you're either going to tap into this 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 uh space where you're trying to overcome something like maybe you had an argument with a friend or a loved one um or maybe something isn't going right at work and you're just kind of talking your way through it when you talk through it things get better they get simpler it's all laid out and you're like ah oh, that's not so bad after all Right, that's one type of journaling for me. And then the other one is when I'm feeling already safe and secure for the day, I'll start to generate. I'll start to talk about like a poem or a song idea or, or certain business ideas to myself. And I'll jot them down in this, um, this transcribed recording that's also like it's recorded audio and it's written down in words that I can revisit over time. and. And after that, you can imagine, you can write books with those kinds of things. So rule number one, come back to it. Every day you journal in the morning. It's called morning pages. And you do it. In the just before you go to rule number two, just basically it's like you download. Yeah. You start to get out of the thinking and you just start to like 
in the, in the beginning, you might have this writer's blog or this thinking blog while it just it's not coming, but you just keep on going and there's going to yeah. be a point when it's just coming through you. Yeah. And you're exact. You nailed it um, probably better than I could have. Right. The, the idea is that your your critical brain, like your left brain starts to starts to get beat down and it's like, OK, I give up. You can be creative for the day. Right. And it's it's almost like um, it's a blessing when you hit that wall you or when you hit the wall, you know it when you break through the wall. Th that's when, you know, today's going to be a good day. I'm going to live a, a grateful, awesome day because I've kind of opened up my brain to opportunities now. So what's rule number two? Rule number two is to take yourself on an artist date once every week. And on what? It's an artist date. So what that means is you do something crazy, cool, outside your comfort zone. Could be one hour, could be two, three. Your wife can come, your spouse can come, your, your friends can come, but ideally you'd like to do it on your own because now you're experiencing a piece of culture or a piece of history or a new part of town whatever it is so that you can get inspired, get curious and start to learn more about it. I think it's also a good way to, to get out of your comfort zone. Wow. Fascinating. So just to, to really yeah, expand your, your own comfort zone as well. That's right. So we've been talking a lot around <clears throat> music, this and this and that and so on, but what is music to you? Yeah, so when I when I think of music, I, I I I actually think of it as one of the 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 best things that's ever happened in my life. Um, I think of it as a physical waveform that can literally hit our bodies and vibrate our bodies. I think of it as a physical waveform that can uh, help to elevate planes. They use sound that helps planes to hover off the ground. I think of I think of it planes, yes, airplanes, airplanes like stealth bombers that can float off the ground. They use sound waves to help to elevate it. I think of it as a way that that you can actually tell stories to the end of the universe and space. Right? We have radio waves. We have um, uh, other kind of waves. Like a sound wave is not dissimilar from things that that can travel across space time quicker than anything that we can imagine. And so I think of it in that capacity, but I also think of it in a capacity of it's, it, it is the key to our souls. It is the key to our emotions. And so, so if you're talking about it on the macro at, um, a cosmic level, yes, I, I feel like that's what music represents to me. But if you talk about it on the quantum, um atomic level it's it's such a profound thing to talk about we relate to songs we we automatically um react to songs when a huge bass is dropped in the middle of the song right it's our it's it's our immediate reaction to be like what just happened right when somebody screams at the top of their lungs it's primal it's like it's it's in our dna to to connect with that, to be strongly um, inspired by that, and our dopamine rises, right? And it's it's nothing more than just a sound wave hitting our bodies, hitting our ears. It has nothing to do with the story that's being told. It has everything to do with the physics of sound that's hitting our body. Maybe it's prenatal when we were coming out of our mom's bodies. <laughs> maybe it's um, maybe it's uh, over time evolution from an evolution perspective. We've, we've learned how to protect ourselves against big sound, right? If you hear a bear, sorry, if you're sitting in the middle of a cave, and sometimes I jump uh, places, if you're sitting in the middle of a cave and there's a fire cooking, and you hear a big <laughs> coming toward you, what's our first reaction going to be? Is it going to be there to just sit and relax? No, we're going to run for the hills or we're going to be probably a bear's lunch versus if there's trickling water, something that's soft, something that's inviting, something that's not so sharp and edgy in our ears, we might go over and observe it and, and say, wow, it's a peaceful stream that we connect with. 
these elements are put into songs that we can connect with. Music is the orchestration of these sounds that we connect with from our heart, from our souls. And I feel like the poetry behind that is its own thing. It's storytelling through words, but sometimes it's very elegant and, and appropriately matched to the music that, that is being played. Does that help to answer you, your question? Yeah, do you have an example for exa uh, how you <laughs> connected with somebody through music? Yeah, um, many examples. Um, let me let me think about that real quick because I guess with within what an intense conversation. I'm so sorry. Um, when I think about music, there's a passive role that it plays that is environmental. So it helps us to study. You've heard of the Mozart effect. Um, it helps us to sleep. Um, but but, but uh, tell talk about the Mozart. Uh, like tell what it is for somebody who does not yes. know it. Yeah, so so I did write down some of the definition last night, but basically it's it's the theory that listening to music of Mozart may temporarily boost things like spatial reasoning and pattern recognition, but it helps people to study. Um, the reason for this... Plants grow better with it, I've heard. What is it? Plants even grow better with it or grow in the direction of, the, of, of Mozart's music, like in the direction of the speaker. Yeah, so so I am I am huge on this concept. When I when I hear coming back to it, music is a waveform. And the sounds that come from Mozart are oboes, stringed instruments. Um, sometimes there's highs, sometimes there's low, 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 lows, and there's a big, huge dynamic element to it. But generally, there is no strong, in-your-face, like edgy kind of vibe that comes from Mozart. It's typically sound waves that that are soothing and and kind of hitting our 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 ear in a very curved kind of way versus a square wave that might be like a Skrillex kind of song. And I feel like there are yoga. You know exactly what I mean when I say yoga music, right? It means like like there's there's um, silent Tibetan singing bowls and there are uh, long sinusoidal waves that that sound very very peaceful even my voice the way in which I'm talking about right now is like very inviting it's soft versus something like this that might be a German accent right <laughs> not to not to your way of it exactly um those those are we react to these things we react to these things. And I feel like the Mozart effect is right on point. I feel like it's right on point. There are sound waves that are inviting for not only human ears, but for the environment in general, the Earth's atmosphere in general, for other life forms that might be plants. I totally believe that because it's a physical waveform that 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 is structured in a way that helps us. So we might... Um, I don't want to get too sci-fi on it. Like I don't have anything to support the Mozart effect, but but, but I, I do. Um, I, I do actually because I've I've heard about um, that, and it might not just be Mozart, but in general, um, when I when I obviously I'm from <clears throat> Vienna, and Vienna is the world capital of classical music, and you just moved here basically, and. Yep. Isn't it a coincidence, first of all, for you as a musician to move like into the music capital or at least classical music capital of the world? At the same time, what I've heard is, and I, it might be true, it might be not, but I've heard it from an Australian woman that she said, oh, Vienna, you have the best water quality in the world. And I said, really? And she said, yeah, it's because of the music. Yeah. And I was like, wow, that's fascinating. Yeah, because of all the classical music and so on, because of the waves and it takes on the water. That's interesting. I um, I love that connection because when I think of yoga, yoga, when I think of the Spotify playlists and SoundCloud playlists that exist that are that are um, meditation music, that are sleep music, that are study music, I think water all day long. I think water, water, water. It's a smooth environment for us to get focused. And, um, you know, some of us can actually study to death metal. But when I think of 
of death metal or something like it, I, I think of jackhammers. I think of, and now people are going to probably unfriend me or unfan me for saying these kinds of things, but, but I think of what, um, what in, in war, in battle, what terrorists might use to actually um, terrorize somebody. They actually use loud sounds constantly to, to disrupt people's eardrums, to, to put them in an uncontrolled, like insufferable environment that they have to live through. And I feel like you can do a lot with sound that is uncomfortable and that also even hurts. And I feel like death metal is not there. It's like, but it's, it's that place where we can go to, to release energy in a different way. Right. It's almost as if we're like, just like aggressively trying to get things out or trying to like um, respond to something. And I feel like music can be helpful in that sense too. Right. It's part of the reason why we connect to, to rock and roll music and and other kinds of things where you scream at the top of your lungs or you have like a bass drop a song cuts out and then boom 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 like you just want to dance your heart away right there are different um calls for attention in those and those are not the mozart effect aaron yeah. take us with you because you are very good in, in reiterating and structuring pieces and also for somebody who Everybody has a connection with music, but the few, just a few people have a connection to music that is as deep as yours. Because for, I would say for the big majority, music is something that, that makes them groove, makes them feel, makes them ooh, excited or, or makes them um, feel a certain emotional state. Yeah. Take, uh, take us with you because you even brought something with you. Take us with you how you actually structure a musical piece. I like it. Yeah. Um, wow. So real, real quick before I, um, I have a song in mind that I want to walk you through, but I also want to preface it with, with something. It's a video that I saw of Ethan Hawke, mm, maybe last year. And he's, he's, I think it might be a Ted talk, but he's talking about creativity so eloquently, very, very strong words from that guy. And he said, He said, when it comes to art, and I think of this specifically in music, he said, when it comes to art, people think it's a luxury. They think that it's like this nice thing that we can collect and that we can, you know, spend time with and all this stuff. And he said, it's, and it's a luxury in most people's minds until you lose a loved one, you go through a breakup, you go through high highs, you have the time of your life, you go through the deepest depths of your life then it becomes necessity because it unlocks a, something that we can relate to that, that, that helps us to connect with that feeling even stronger. And, and I, I, I just swell when I hear that quote because, because it's the truth. Art and music are a necessity in our lives. I feel like everybody knows how to connect with music Maybe I have a way in which I can articulate it. I can write it down on paper. I can play it. Maybe I'm, I'm given some sort of gift there. I don't, I don't know. Many people can practice their way to that. But, but I feel like all of us connect to dancing. All of us connect to feeling a strong emotion during a song. And, and it's just our bodies telling us something. And so, so for that, I just wanted to preface that because um, I think it's a really powerful statement. Okay, so would you mind if I share my screen? Um, sure. I have a song to share to, with everybody. And let me see if I can do this. This is a song that I wrote when I was in high school. I was 15 years old. Mm -hmm. And it's not, it's not about a breakup. Um, but it, it's a rocky time in a relationship that I was going through. <laughs> and so music became necessity for me. Um, but I, I wasn't really into poetry when I was younger. And I also, um, I would always just love to sit and, and craft out the instruments and the highs and lows of a song. And so I'm going to tell a story as this is happening. 
um, because it's basically a telephone conversation between me and my partner at the time. And there are very specific things that happen during that phone call that shape the way in which the music sounds. You guys ready? Sure. Let's do it. <clears throat> so there's something that's happening during this part. It's a little bit bizarre. It's eerie. You're like in this weird space. And it's called a hemiola. And a hemiola is, is um, something where you have two time signatures that are kind of overlapping each other. The reason why that's important for this song is, be whoops, is because um, my partner at the time and I were talking over each other. We were on a different wavelength. We weren't having the same conversation. We were talking through each other, trying to get our points across. There was even an like, argument escalated. And then eventually there was this peaceful pause in the conversation. And she started telling me about her day. And we were connecting, having this awesome um, uh, conversation with each other. She went to the grocery store and was picking out like all of her items, all of the stuff. It was just small talk. And then eventually she had the nerve to tell me that there was this guy at the grocery store that started hitting on her. And I got really upset. Like, I didn't know how to deal with my own emotions. I didn't know how to um, uh, deal with like jealousy at the time or those kinds of things. Things that I'm much better at now. But this represents kind of the anger of that story that comes to you. And there's, there's much more to this story, but, but you can understand that like each part of that was kind of thought about in terms of my emotions. Um, toward the end of the song, I might be able to find it. One second. So there's a solo, there's words, there's all this stuff. It's all cinematic thing. At the end, she tells me about her connection with her father and how, how she just starts opening up about their relationship and how they don't get along so well. And I feel like, oh, she's she's like really vulnerable right now. I feel connected with her. And you know, there are choppy parts like her and her father get into arguments. Um, but there's this bit build that, that just kind of like starts to emerge and I feel like we became even more and more connected in that conversation. Um, and this part draws out kind of a bit too much. It's like it flows at this point. Um, but at the end, there is a coffee shop outro because her dad was driving home and she was grounded, wasn't supposed to be on the call. And we had to we had to get off the call. But basically it's this cafe like acoustic guitar outro that I can't seem to to grab there. So so, so everything basically packed into into music. Wow. Exactly. Eric, our time has really been flying. First of all, tell us if somebody would like to get in contact with you, where can they find you? Yeah, best place is going to be musiceverywhere.io is the best place to go. You can see the projects I'm working on. I'm releasing a project with SoundCloud. Um, that's a that's an easy, fun way for people to find concerts in their city. Um, there's other kinds of uh, um, uh, mental health projects I'm working on with music, but my email is down there, musiceverywhere.io. Awesome. Any last 30 second piece of advice that, or, or something that uh, the final thoughts that you would like to give our audience with like a 30 second one? <clears throat> I hadn't come prepared for that, but I, I would have to say that, um, uh, life is precious and it's important that we connect with it. We connect with our own creative energy. We connect with our families. We connect with our loved ones. And, and that we pick up on other people's stories. We, we dare to actually um, feel an emotion from it. And we also create our own stories so that we can inspire and impact others. Very beautiful. Thank you so much. You, that was a beautiful, beautiful show. It was really inspirational and also inspiring. Thank you so much. A big hand, Aaron Winfield. Woo! Thank you. Thank you, everybody. 
Thank you for sticking with us until the end. To make this content even more valuable for you, please leave a comment below and share your thoughts and also share this video with somebody you care about who absolutely needs to see this. Thank you very much. Have an outstanding day and see you next time.